Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Brother, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing? I'm good. Good to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Am I the first person to interview you? Second. Second person? Yeah. Why don't you give me the privilege of interviewing your first brother? <laughs> Welcome to the Did You I Know did, show. I, I, I didn't know you then. You didn't know me then, no. but now you know me. No, I Do you know. know? Yes. You don't know? I did know. you know? I Allahu know. Akbar. <laughs> Great to have you on the show, brother, and uh, alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm excited to have you here. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, we want to take two or three things away from your life. Alhamdulillah, you've memorized the Quran and uh, you're still learning the likes of it. And uh, a lot of people out there who are watching this show want to also memorize the Quran. They want to, you know, become as cool and also memorize the Quran at the same time. Now, my first question to you is this. How did you memorize the Quran? Was it at an older age or it started since when you were a child? I started at a very young age. How old? About 11, 12, 13. I'm really? Not sure exactly. Wow. I was, at, I think, in primary four or five. Ah. That's when I started. Amazing. And how, how, it came, um, how I started was um, my dad worked at a FCDA. Yes. Opposite. Right opposite FCDA, there's a there's mosque. A, there's a masjid around Yeah, there's there. a masjid. Right yeah, now, yeah. it's under con renovations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, he heard about uh, they were opening a school for Quran memorization, mm -hmm. and he knew the imam of the mosque then. Uh. So he spoke to him, and then the requirements was that you memorize uh, one juice, which is two hizbs, from from Amr to Nas. Okay, that's from Amr to Nas. From Amr to Nas. Mm -hmm. And then if you do that, then you come and you get tested. Yeah. And if... You passed the test, then did you pass? Uh, yeah, I passed. Mashallah. <laughs> so what happened after then? You got into. How did your father tell you? Did he instruct you that you must go to the school, or he asked you, you know, uh, do, do you want to go to the school or something? No, then it wasn't my first time being in an Islamia. Right. So from a very young age, we had, you go to Islamia, but we still had a teacher that would come home. Mm. So. I was already doing, like, reading the Quran, learning how to read the Quran, baki, in the Zakar, had a baki, <laughs> doing that, but um, it was never memorization. No. Yes, you would still memorize, but right. it wasn't, like, a requirement. Like, the teacher wouldn't come and tell you, oh, have you memorized this? Have you? you just learned. So there wasn't that plan, okay, we want you to memorize the Quran. Mm. So it was then when he um, spoke to this imam, his friend, then he spoke to me about it. It wasn't anything like serious, a serious conversation. He just, he just uh, spoke to my mother and the teacher we had at the time, Malim yeah, yeah, yeah. he was instructed to, okay, I want him to memorize two hisabs. Oh. And then I memorized for Amatunas, then I went for the interview, I was tested and then I passed. Mashallah. And then I got in. And at the time it was, I don't think we were more than 20 in the class. Mm probably about maybe 10, maybe, maybe splits between 10, 10 male, 10 females. Right. So the, like, and I think about two teachers. So it was very hands-on. It, it wasn't so like- they focused on you Yeah, guys. they really like focused they had, on they us. They knew that they had a project that they needed to deliver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us from that class at the beginning, I think we were all able to memorize the Quran. Like we're all fast now. Uh, was, it, was it secondary school or primary school that you started? No, I was in primary school. Primary school. Yeah, right. I was in primary school. So um, the, it was a very good foundation. Mm. Like it wasn't, it wasn't just memorization, it was with Tajweed and everything. Like so the in essence, package. the two hisabs that we memorized at home, we had to memorize it again from the beginning. Uh. So the two hisabs was just a test to see if you're capable of doing it. So when we came in, we now had to polish that mm. and then build upon it. Amazing. And um, yeah. So it was a very good foundation with uh, Tajweed and proper recitation. We, I remember then, we probably like three hours during the weekends because it was the the timings were during the weekends from nine to six mm. and then during the during the weekdays was from i think f 2 30 to six but like it was quite difficult because some schools close at different timings yeah and i think i used to go there probably like three to four o'clock mm. so probably like two hours during the weekdays so that, that continued till secondary school? That continued till secondary school. So at a point in time in your life, you were in secondary school, you had so much friends and likes of it. How were you able to bring a balance whereby you have your friends, you want to chill out with them, and you have to be at the Islamia? How did you cope with that? Um, I coped with that. Uh, I wouldn't say I was distracted, per se. But they came, like, I think by when I was in SS1, mm. 
I didn't really want to do it anymore. At SS1, you didn't yeah. want to memorize the I didn't want to, not. I was too distracted. Ah. I was, I was, uh, I felt like I was missing, missing out. Hmm. Because during the whole, from primary school till I came into, I went to secondary school, so I went, I went to a different school. Right. I went to uh, an American school. So when I went, it was, it was, it was different. It was very different. Like my entire class, we went more than 20. Hmm. So you, it was a big change because being in a primary school, probably in your class alone, maybe you have prim class one, class two, same primary six, but maybe six different classes. Right. And each class was about 30 students. Okay. So within that 30 students, you tend to find your own niche. Maybe you have four friends. But now you find yourself in a different school, multicultural. You have classmates from different parts of the world. Mm. And then you're not, you're not even more than 20. So then, how do you really get to know these people? You have never really been in an international <laughs> community, yeah. per se. So um, that was a bit challenging. I, at first, I didn't, my first year, I, I hated it. Hmm. And before then, I had, um, I did the common entrance for NTIC. But I just didn't get to go there. My father preferred me to go to a different school. To, to go to a different school. Hmm. So, for the first year, I didn't want to. I didn't want to go. In, I didn't. I didn't want to stay. I complained and complained. But my father just said I should just give it. He, he just said, okay, just give it a year. For sure. But within that one year, I, I now, I now adapted. And my first friend I made, uh, Muhammad Lawan, he was in a year. He was in the year below me. Mm. So I was in Jesus one. He was in primary six. Amazing. But he was the first person, Muslim, from the north that I could speak Hausa with. He was the first friend I... So there was a bit we, of familiarity Exactly. Now. And then there was football. Like, I enjoyed playing football. I was, I was good <laughs> at it then. Yeah. So that was what it's kind of... some of the distraction you got. At, at, at that time, it wasn't necessarily a distraction. Mm. But I'm just trying to get you to when it, it did become a distraction. Right. Yeah. So after I started making friends, then as I got comfortable. I started enjoying it. And um, maybe two, three years after that... Uh, towards like maybe I was in ninth grade, that's like SS1 mm. or just SS3. And that was when I then started getting distracted. I, I didn't necessarily want to be in Islamia anymore, but not just me, it was like everyone. My, class, my friends from Islamia themselves, because, and there are a couple of factors that, that, came, in, that came in play then. Like. like, so by then we had memorized probably maybe half the Quran or from maybe 40 years from uh, Surah to, from Tawbah to Nas. Right. And we used to get tested we, like weekly. So weekly, during the weekends, you come, you sit down in front of the teacher and he will test you. Hmm. Run from anywhere. And any mistake, one mistake. You'll be lashed. You'll be lashed. Yes, Salah. It was a problem because they never give us a process to retain what, you've what we have memorized. Mm. If you didn't give me a process, then is it really fair for you to come and like, we used to get, we used to have a competition, Musabaka, every, every third term. So at the end of, ending, ending of the year. But that, like you knew that was coming. So even then, they didn't necessarily give you the tools to be able to prepare for that. You had to do it yourself. So I'll just be at home, because I still, despite me going to Islamic school, I had the teacher at home. Mm. So I'll tell the teacher, okay, this is what I want. The teacher himself didn't give, necessarily give me a process through which I could, I could like retain what I, what I memorized. So I just made a structure for myself. Mm. Okay, I'll do this, I'll do this. And that will work for you. And that worked for me. But during the term, I didn't really have that. So those tests that they used to have, and I was amongst, I was amongst the best students then. So probably till about more than half the Quran, I didn't really have a problem then. It wasn't too much for me to carry. To carry. Mm. But then it started getting too much. So then, me that I never got beaten, I started getting beat. Oof. So at that point, I didn't really like it anymore. I didn't really like it anymore. So it discouraged you? It discouraged me. And then I remember there was a time I was, uh, I was beat at the back of my neck. I, he didn't intend to hit me at the back of my neck, but he got but me. It here. happened. It happened. And mm. then my skin went off. Mm. It was quite deep. Then I went back home and my, mo and my mom saw it. And she wanted to go crazy. And um, when my father came back and she told him about it, she's like, okay, this teacher, I'm going to go and meet him tomorrow. Then he looked at her and he was like, um, he was like, 
what he's benefiting from this man is more than what this man has done. Allah So, like, I'm sure he himself regrets it. So I don't know if whether he spoke to the teacher, like behind behind the scenes, probably he did because that never happened. Well, he treated the situation very well. Yes, very yeah. well. And and now looking back, like may Allah bless your parent. I mean, <laughs> now looking back, I, I like I saw the wisdom behind what he did because if he had allowed that, my, to, happen. that to happen, which happens nowadays, my younger brother was telling me just I think a couple of months ago, I, I, I think it has been about two years now. Yeah, a parent came and slapped a teacher. Oof. In the presence of everyone in the school, Subhanallah. for beating his child. So now with this, they lose the baraka of the knowledge. It does. Yeah. It does because uh, as uh, you had the discussion with Ben Abdul earlier, if you don't respect the people that you take knowledge from, how does that knowledge become beneficial? Allah, you're right, Habibi. You're right. You know, just just before we go on, you said that there was a method you used for yourself to memorize the Quran, which of course it wasn't given to you by the scholars, and then you just created the way to memorize the Quran. What way did you use that made it easy for you in memorization? What did you use? And what do you do still today that helps you to keep your memorization intact? Today I have a proper process, but, yeah. but then it was just, okay, I know what I know. This part I don't really know. Mm. How do I practice? So let's see about the proper process you have now. <laughs> the proper process I have now, I took from the um, Islamic Institute I went to when I was in, during my time in university in Birmingham. Yeah. So in Birmingham, there's a, a Birmingham Quran Academy. Yeah. So that's where, during the, I was I've, I was in the UK for five six years, and the last four years I attended there every day. Mm. And during that duration, I think I spent more time in the masjid than I did in my lecture halls. Mm. And then they had a proper process. So the teachers are mainly Pakistani. Oh. So Pakistani and Egyptian teachers. W w the goal of the Birmingham Grand Academy is to, so when you, if you go, Pakistan has the highest number of Hufas mm. around the world. I think right. about two million. Yeah. Um, and they have, they are very, very strong. I don't think, I've, I've never met people like that so know the Quran by heart. The Hifs is so strong. Then the Egyptians, they recite beautifully. Mm. So the idea there is then to bring these two things together. Allah. So the Pakistani teachers don't necessarily recite as beautifully, but they train you to know how to recite properly properly. how to properly make your hips strong. Mm. So the process was, if every day you increase one page, you, you learn one page yeah. that you didn't know before, you have to recite 10 pages behind before that new page. Hmm. And also every day, 10 pages from the beginning of where you started your memorization, mm. you have to recite 10 pages. So in essence, every day you recite at least 20 pages. Mm. If every day you're, you're, you're practicing 20 pages, let's say you're someone that has memorized the Quran, that's two hijabs a day, it takes you in a month, you have revised everything that you've memorized. So that works for someone who just, if I just started hips today, that process, if I take it upon myself to continue doing it, like, there's a very high chance you retain your memorization and you'll become right. a very strong first. consistency. Yeah, so right now, the process I use, right now I have a teacher who I'm trying to get my ijazah from. Right. And right now I probably recite at least three, four hizibs every day to him. Mm. So, and it's something that, if I, like I took a break well, when I went for Umrah, and during that time I realized that I wasn't practicing as much. Mm. So if it was up to me, I don't know what the future holds, but my plan is to probably have my teacher with me probably for the rest of my life because it just works for me. That's how I, during that time, I know every day I dedicate this amount of hours and it's not that so long. There's a need to get a teacher. There's a need to get a teacher because mm -hmm. you can't do it yourself. Right. I have a couple of friends that have come to me or like I would like to learn and I'm also a student. Mm. And... Um, maybe we can only go as far. Probably you start today, you come, tomorrow you don't come. You and I both, we are the same on the same level. What can I really come and tell you? So I think people need to be ready. If they want to memorize the Quran, they need to be really ready to see, see I have to go through all the struggles and the hustle to 
get this uh, yani, uh, Quran in my head, like the consistency, basically. A lot of us don't to keep that consistency. Like, we come today, tomorrow we'll then give an excuse. Mm-hmm. And this is a huge problem. Like, from what you said, I think uh, the, the method that they use for you, for the fact that you memorize from behind and then memorize again, you know, from uh, the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's really helped you and there was that consistency. Yeah. Now, at this point, right? What advice, as a, young, as a young person, right? We are both young people. Mm-hmm. What advice will we give to anyone watching this out there who has decided to, okay, yeah, I will memorize the Quran, I want to start learning. What do you think should be the first thing to do for it to help them become good memorizers of the Quran? First thing is to know that it's possible, is to know that it's attainable, is to know that you can actually do it. Mm. It's not people that do do it are not, they don't have two heads. It's something that it does take time it, with patience. You, you, you don't expect to start and in a week you have gone so far. Mm. Like you want to start reciting like two days or something. <laughs> like Shurain. Like, or like Shurain. Yeah. That's not, that's <laughs> not possible. Right. It's something that it takes, it comes with its challenges mm. at the beginning. But when you overcome those challenges, then it becomes smooth. Smooth sailing. Yeah. But that beginning phase that's when you have to be very, very dedicated and serious and have a proper process. And that's why you need a teacher. You need someone who has undergone that same process as you. He might not necessarily, necessarily have the same challenges that you, you, you currently face in your life. Maybe you work, maybe you do. He might not have that, but he has an understanding. And if you're on the same page with him, right now my, I have younger sisters who, they are university. They also started HIFS in the same school that I went to, mm. but they went to boarding school. And when, after they went to boarding school, it was gone. Uh-huh. They came back and my parents have been trying to get them to do it, but it has. So that means parents need to maintain that momentum? That momentum has to be maintained. Mm. At least till the child reaches a certain level where he is able to maintain himself. Mm. When I went to university, no one ever told me, oh, you have to go and find the, go and find the school, go and find the teacher. No one ever did that. I went by myself. Why? Because for 17 years of my life, not 17 years, from maybe 13 till I was 17, mm. maybe five, six years of my life, every single day I had the Quran. When I went to university, it was up to me whether I wanted to do it or not. Mm. And then my, f- my first year, my foundation year, nothing. I'll make a, I'll make a plan, okay, I w- I'll, I'll, I'll like to revise this amount every day. It didn't work. In university? In university. Mm. Why? In Nigeria, I had a process. Even if I didn't do it, my mother would look at, oh, have you done this today? Have you, no one was there to tell me to, oh, have you done this? Mm. Even if they did ask, you can lie, you can say whatever. And then during that first year, leading to my second year, I, I don't think I've ever been confused in my life. I just felt I had so much free time that I didn't know what to do with. Mm. And, uh, I feel like a human being is meant to be, you're meant to, you're meant to be busy. You're meant to- Have the motivation. You're meant to have, you have, Allah has blessed you with certain capabilities, mm. which if you don't make use of, you become, you yourself, you don't feel fulfilled. Right. And not having that f- sense of fulfillment within me, I still went to uni, I still, but I was, I had, I was accustomed to always being busy, always doing something and having so much free time then that's when you probably start doing certain things that you shouldn't be doing. Mm. And I just didn't really feel, I, I felt I lost it. Mm. And what happened, I think when I came back for my second year in uni, that was when there was a competition. I just saw, I think I saw it in a, in a, in a I went to the mosque then, I saw like a flyer that there was a, like a Quran competition happening here and I just signed myself up. Then I went, I think it was about, Two hisips, just two hisips. Mm. So I just took two, the first two hisips from uh, Baqarah. So from beginning of Baqarah to the second hisip, where the second hisip to Sayyikolo Sofaha. Right. Then I went to the competition and I came first. And it was very surprising for them because it was someone that wasn't from their community. It was someone that wasn't even from their country. It was someone that wasn't even the same color as them that could recite the Quran so well and had it memorized in it, and I didn't even speak Arabic. Mm. So they found it very fascinating, and then... Did that motivate you? That motivated me for a very long time. 
throughout my, from the time I started doing HIFS in Nigeria, mm. there was always that, I've always felt privileged from how my parents treat me, from how my grandmother, my grandmother is the one who, like, she probably doesn't care about anyone in the family but me. Why? Because of the Quran. Allah Akbar. So, having that and not feeling it for a very long time, after I went to uni, there was no one to, no, no one gave, no one cared, even if you say, oh, you are, you are half, you have to, no one cares. Mm -hmm. And for the first time having that, okay, these people, like, know what the Quran is, they give it its importance, and they see that you have it, and they are in awe of you. And when they did that, I just realized, man, that's probably what I'm missing. Like, I have, the Quran has become a part of me, and the fact that I don't necessarily have that with me was what made me feel empty. Hmm. Which was the reason why then I just, uh, I found a school there. You made a decision. I didn't necessarily make a decision then. Hmm. I, had a, I have a cousin, uh, Sadiq, yeah. who his father, we used to do hips together here in, uh, in Nigeria. And before he went, he also went to boarding school and he stopped. Yeah. So his father said I should find a school for him. So when I found the school, I just also got myself in. Allah's way of taking you back. Yeah. <laughs> and then we started and then I was able to, at the time that I started, probably I've, I've forgotten half of the yes, Quran. Sir. So you live the Quran the Quran lives you? Yes. You leave it for a day, it leaves you for two weeks. <laughs> so that was when I started again from the very beginning. And then I was able to finish. Um, I didn't even tell them that I had memorized the Quran prior. I told them, okay, I, I, I've done hips, but I, I didn't really tell them because it's, it's, it, you feel ashamed of yourself for having finished and let it, and let it go. Yes. I couldn't tell them, oh, I, have, I memorized the Quran and I've forgotten it. So I just told them, oh, I did about half. So then I was able to now finish. Sure. And then I, re I remember I had a Walima, all my friends from to, all, all over the UK, yeah, they came for it. And sure. then that was when I led Tarawi for the f very first time. And yeah. Alhamdulillah, you know, I, I wish and I pray that uh, we all learn to memorize the Quran, inshallah. And uh, sure. may Allah give us the ability to have ikhlas, you know, the sincerity of purpose and uh, memorizing the Quran. Just before we end the show, uh, do you have any verse that stands out the most for you that you would like to share with us? Any? I don't... One thing that I would like to say, just hold that thought, right. is um, when they say, Ahlul Quran, the very first time I spoke to you, I had a conversation with you. I think you saw my video from, yeah, 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 yeah. from Lalo. Yeah. And then you spoke to him and then he gave you my contact. You said you want to, like, Ahlul Quran, you want to be like me, mm. Ahlul Quran. But Ahlul Quran is not just someone who memorizes the Quran. Mm. You might have someone who memorizes the Quran, but they're not from Ahlul Quran. Why? Because they don't practice upon it. Mm. They don't live by it. Ahlul Quran are those who live by it, practice it, when you, they said, the Prophet Muhammad, when you see him, so, so. you see the Quran. So that is Ahlul Quran. It's not necessarily the memorization of the Quran. Yes, the memorization is important, it's virtuous, mm. but that's not the most important thing. It's actually making use of it, hmm. which is the difficult part and which is what is truly rewarding. Very important. Yeah. Uh, regarding a verse that stands out to me, um, Surah Al Nur. Allah Nur Samawati Wal Ard, the verse that speaks about those who stay in the mosque, those who um, light upon light. Yeah. It's like within, like those who stay close to Allah are those who really have the light, are who live their lives, and their lives, their lives are just lit. Yes, they gain happiness, they have contentment, they have peace. Hmm. Yeah, that's the verse. Mashallah, would you like mashallah. me to recite the verse? Or? We would love it, Habibi. All right. <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله نور السماوات والأرض مثل نوره كمشكات فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة 
الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس والله بكل شيء عليم في بيوت أذن في بيوت أذن الله أن ترفع ويذكر فيها اسمه يسبح له فيها بالغدو والآصال صدق الله العظيم يا سلام حبيبي I want to tear but uh, we just end the show and then we tear together جزاك الله خير beautiful habi you habibi may Allah protect you may Allah give you the ability to live by the Quran and may Allah give you the strength to teach all the people the Quran and most importantly may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you sincerity of purpose in all you do thank you so much for being on the show thanks for having me alhamdulillah dear viewers well We've come to the end of this uh, discussion and I'm glad that he was able to share his story. The reason why we had this episode was for you to be motivated to learn the Quran. Uh, you know, if, if, if people like him can learn the Quran, others can learn the Quran as well. And also we ask that Allah give us the strength to be able to learn the Quran as much as we can until we meet on the next episode. I'll leave you on the care of Allah. And you know, before the next episode, if you can memorize, let's say two pages, if that you have memorized before, Send us a message and we will give you a gift. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.